Grace Hopper, Queen of Computer Code, by Lori Walmark. Grace leaned back in her chair and yawned. Once again, she had worked far into the night writing computer code. Grace's latest computer program, one to guide Navy missiles, was almost complete. All that was left was to check her work. Grace reviewed the code line by line, making sure she hadn't made any mistakes. When she finished, Grace set down her pencil and frowned. The last section of her program, a bit of code that multiplied numbers, looked familiar. She checked back through her work and found she had written that same code before, over and over and over again. Grace snorted. What a colossal waste of time. There had to be a better way. Why not make the computer do the work? Computers were good at doing boring jobs. I was lazy as all get out. I never wanted to do anything over again. She figured out a way to store pieces of a program, like her multiplication code, inside the machine. When she needed to use that code in another program, all Grace had to do was tell the computer where to find it. The computer then joined together many bits of code into one complete program. No one had ever done that before. Grace was the first. Even as a child, Grace loved to tinker with gadgets and learn new ideas. She wanted to understand how things worked so she could make them better. When Grace was seven, she unscrewed the back of her alarm clock and took a peek. She reached in and... Spring! Out popped a spring, followed by several gears. One rolled across the floor and under her bed. Grace scooped up the parts and tried to put them back together. No matter which piece she put where, she couldn't get the clock to run. She needed another clock she could study, one that still worked. Grace sprinted from room to room. Clock by clock, she fiddled with gears and springs, levers and pins. She arranged them this way and that. Seven clocks later, seven-year-old Grace understood what made clocks tick. When Grace's mother discovered the many jumbles of clock parts scattered around the house, all she could do was laugh. After all, Grace was just being Grace. Once Grace figured out how clocks worked, she moved on to bigger challenges. She followed a complicated blueprint and constructed a dollhouse made of stone. But there were no stairs. How could her dolls get to the top floor? If you've got a good idea and you know it's going to work, go ahead and do it. Not a problem for junior engineer Grace. She opened her toy construction kit and laid out everything she'd need. Nuts, bolts, metal pieces, and an electric motor. It took some experimentation, but Grace figured it out. Now her dolls had an elevator to go upstairs. Grace delighted in learning difficult concepts. The harder, the better. While her schoolmates wore frilly dresses and learned to be young ladies, Grace studied math and science. Her bedroom overflowed with books and scientific equipment. She raced through her high school classes and finished two years early. Grace couldn't wait to start college more classes, more learning, more fun. On the day her college entrance grades arrived, Grace's hands trembled. She ripped open the envelope and proudly read aloud to her parents the many high marks in math and science. When she reached the grade for Latin, Grace fell silent. Failed! She had failed Latin. Without Latin, Grace couldn't go to college. Without college, Grace couldn't be a mathematician. Without math, Grace couldn't be Grace. Grace waved to her schoolmates as they left for college without her. Nothing would stop her from joining them next year. She held her head high and returned to her studies. Working hard, Grace even conquered Latin. 
At the end of the year, she passed all her exams. With her trunks packed and her math books in hand, Grace left for Vassar College, an all-women's school. Some of her classmates took classes called Husbands and Wives and Motherhood, but not Grace. Her favorite subjects were math and physics. Grace did more in college than just study. Whenever there was fun or adventure to be found, she was always first in line. Her personal motto was dare and do. When a barnstormer came to town offering plane rides, Grace rushed to sign up. I squandered all my money, it cost $10, and went up in the plane. She pulled herself up into the seat behind the pilot and adjusted her goggles. With a deafening roar, the propeller sputtered into action. The biplane rattled across the field and lifted off. With each loop-the-loop -loop through the air, Grace's grin grew wider and wider. Because of Grace's hard work and intelligence, the other students respected her abilities. They often came to her for help with their studies. One day, her fellow students entered the room only to see a bathtub filled to the brim with water. Grace invited a volunteer to step into the tub, clothes and all. Water sloshed over the edges and flooded the floor. The students burst into laughter. Grace explained the reason for this tidal wave. The volume of the student's body pushed out the same volume of water. The result? One soggy student wrapped in a towel and one math lesson never forgotten. When Grace moved on to graduate school at Yale University, there was only one other woman in her class. This didn't bother Grace in the least. Our young people are the future. We must provide for them. Grace wanted to share her passion for math, so she took a job teaching at Vassar College. Her classes were always both practical and fun. Even though Grace loved teaching, America was now at war and needed the best mathematicians to design weapons. Patriotic Grace wanted to help her country, so she tried to enlist in the Navy. That proved to be a problem. Based on the Navy's requirements for new recruits at the time, Grace was too old and too skinny to enlist. She was 36 and weighed only 105 pounds. Grace could be very persuasive, however. It took her more than a year, but Grace convinced the Navy that they needed her. Faithfulness in all things, my motto is you see, the world will be a better place when all agree with me. Because of her superior math skills, Grace was assigned to write programs for one of the first computers ever built, the Mark I. Only a few people had ever programmed before, so she had to learn how to do it on her own. One late summer day, a co-worker burst into Grace's office. The new computer, the Mark II, had stopped working. She gasped. This had never happened before, not with any of her programs. Grace thought it had to be a prank. After all, she loved playing jokes on her co-workers. Maybe the other engineers were getting their revenge. But they weren't. The computer really wasn't working. For hours, Grace and her team reviewed the code, but could find no error. It was as if the green ceramic gremlin that always sat in Grace's office had come to life and sneaked into the machine to make mischief. That was it. Maybe the problem wasn't in her program. Maybe it was in the computer. Grace jumped to her feet and hurried down the hall. The immense computer room usually thrummed with the click of metal switches and the whir of paper tape. Today, all was silent. I have insatiable curiosity. It's solving problems. Every time you solve a problem, another one shows up behind it. That's the challenge. Grace and her team searched everywhere for the problem. 
Grace used her pocket mirror to check inside the machine. She angled it this way and that. No matter where the engineers looked, they didn't see anything wrong. No loose wires or stray sparks. Not even a naughty gremlin. The engineers were stumped. They had checked everything. What could be causing the problem? Then someone saw it. A moth was trapped inside, blocking a switch from working properly. One of the engineers borrowed Grace's eyebrow tweezers and removed the dead moth. The computer started up again with no problem. Being good scientists, Grace and her team taped the moth into the logbook to record their unusual finding. They added a note. First actual case of a computer bug being found. Ever since then, because of Grace's sense of humor, computer glitches have been called bugs. Early computers didn't understand letters or words, only programs filled with lines and lines of ones and zeros. As Grace worked on a brand new computer called the Univac 1, she thought about ways to make programming even easier. Not everyone was as comfortable thinking in numbers as she. Grace wanted anyone to be able to use computers, not just scientists and engineers. Grace glanced at the wall clock she had rigged to run backward. It reminded her to use her imagination. Unconventional thinking was often the key to solving problems. Humans are allergic to change. They like to say, we've always done it this way. I try to fight that. To allow her brain a chance to consider new ideas, Grace took a break from programming. She doodled cartoons of gremlins and dragons and other fantastical creatures. While she drew, she asked herself questions. Why should people have to learn computer language? Why couldn't computers learn people language? They could. Grace invented a program that let people use words to tell the computer what to do. Her program, named Flowmatic, included simple English commands like multiply. Flowmatic translated multiply and other commands into instructions that the computer could understand. Let people write their programs in English. It was common sense. This was much easier than programming pages of ones and zeros. With the help of Grace's program, she and her coworkers were able to write code more quickly and with fewer errors. When Grace was 60 years old, the Navy forced her to retire. They said she was too old to serve. It was the saddest day of my life. Within a few months, they realized their mistake and asked her to return for a short six-month assignment. This short assignment lasted for 20 years. Grace, now an admiral, finally retired from the Navy for the second time at age 80. For almost 50 years, Grace Hopper, the queen of computer code, dedicated her life to solving computer problems. No wonder people called her Amazing Grace. In the 1950s, Grace Hopper taught computers to speak English. She created a program called Flowmatic to translate simple English commands into binary, the language of computers. This meant that programmers no longer had to spend hours of time writing zeros and ones to teach computers what to do. Instead, they could code quickly in plain, simple English. Would you like to learn to speak the language of computers? Get ready to code! If you're using a STEAM kit from the Coos Bay Public Library, you received this chart of the English alphabet in binary. If you're doing this project without a STEAM kit, just come back to this part of the video and pause whenever you need to use the chart. So what is binary? Binary is a method of storing information using only two options, yes or no, or black or white, or zeros and ones. Each letter on our chart is made up of a series of eight boxes, 
colored in either black or white. The black boxes represent zero, and the white boxes represent one. We are going to code three letters into zeros and ones, so we'll start with three sets of eight boxes. When you're finished, it will look something like this. These are my initials, R, E, and L, in binary. Each box where you choose 0 or 1 is called a bit of information, which is a contraction of the words binary and digit. We're going to make a bracelet, representing each bit of information with a bead. Place a white bead on each bit containing a 0 and a colored bead on each bit containing a 1. 8 bits is called 1 byte of information. So each letter contains one byte. Any guesses what four bits of information is called? It's a nibble. I bet Grace Hopper would have approved of that name. Here's what it will look like when you're finished. You've encoded three bytes of information. Now let's make it into a bracelet. First thread one clear bead onto the elastic. Then string the first byte of beads. Add a clear spacer between each set of 8 beads to separate the bytes of information. Add the next 8 beads and spacer, and then the last 8 beads and spacer. You can adjust the fit of this bracelet by adding a few more extra beads at the end. Then double knot the elastic, pull it tight, and trim off any extra. Have fun showing off your new computer-coded accessory! Hmm, I wonder what else I can write in binary. Let's see, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay, I've got it. This is a secret message just for those who speak binary. See if you can crack my code. Have fun coding. For more information about receiving STEAM kits in the mail, visit the Kids and Families page at coosbaylibrary.org.